Chapter 11 Nothing came during our night watch except the beginnings of a wind that was to whistle and moan and blow at us clear across the open prairie lands for days on end. That wind seemed to start just about where the last of the humans ended. Indians and settlers both. It wasn't till the next afternoon, though, that something else came out of the surrounding shoulder-high blue-stem grass that was seared brown and dry by the same wind. First, it was Jabeth, bolting from nowhere, a few partridges hanging from his belt. Company coming, he sang out in warning. Mr. Peace stopped the wagon short. The horses, tied behind on loose ropes, danced to a halt. My birds started bunching into one another, their strides broken. Emmett ignored the birds and set into a barking jag. Bidwell Peace craned his neck and trained his eyes to the northeast where even I could now see some sort of motion parting the tall grass. We're past the reservation already, ain't that so, Mr. Peace? I asked with a sudden sense of foreboding. Got to be, he muttered. Wonder what the rules truly is about Indians leaving their lands versus white folks crossing them. Jabeth was already by the rear of the wagon. Won't I should haul out the rifle, Mr. Peace, sir? Rather, you didn't. I got a distaste for violence in general. Also, wouldn't do a whole pack of good if there's more of them than there is of us. Jabeth didn't like that answer. What we supposed to do then, just sit here a waiting to be done in? Ain't a solitary place to take shelter on this empty prairie, if there was some decent woods at least. I clambered up the wagon next to Mr. Peace to get a better viewpoint. Coming closer, I reported. Seems to be only one batch, in a more or less straight line through the grass. I squinted some more, then let out a whistle. Oh, my! What is it, Simon? Mr. Peace stood on the bench next to me, and Jabeth clawed up the side, too. What in the world? Monsters! Jabeth squeaked. These monsters coming at us! I started to chuckle. Then it grew into a belly laugh. Jabeth and Mr. Peace both pounded at me till I took control of myself again. Let go! Stop! I cried. Ain't monsters at all, nor Indians neither. It's only camels, and they're carrying Paul and Cleaver. That does it! Jabez scrambled down and headed for the wagon's rear. Ain't nobody going to stop me from loading the rifle this time. Paul and Cleaver must have gone back to their circus after all. Where else would they get camels? A whole family of them. For as they came closer, I couldn't help but recognize the papa camel that had grown so pitifully when loaded with burdens in the circus ring. Also, the mama camel. Cleaver was riding her just behind Paul, and behind them, loping to keep up, was the little fella. Their gait was kind of unnatural, but maybe that's the way of it with camels. What also wasn't natural was what Paul and Cleaver was doing as they bore down on us. I don't believe it, Mr. Peace breathed out. After all the water what's already flowed under the bridge... Even after mentioning them to the Indians, I never really believed that Paul and Cleaver would come after us again. Right. And now those scoundrels are aiming rifles at us. Not only were they aiming, they were actually beginning to shoot. Duck! I yelled and acted accordingly. Those shots really shouldn't have bothered me at first, though. First off, they was aimed from the top of camels, which looked to be the closest thing to riding an earthquake I'd ever seen. And from what I understood, earthquakes wasn't conducive to straight shooting. Next, <laughs> there was Jabeth, stretched out full length next to the wagon gate, ready to pick off anything that moved should he decide to pull his trigger. I snuck around the side of the wagon, the sheltered side, to find out exactly why. Why aren't you shooting back, Jabeth? I stretched out next to him on the ground. They's jerking around too much on them monsters. Wouldn't mind winging either of them a little. Indeed, I wouldn't. He kept his attention straight ahead on the oncoming enemy, but I ain't got no heart for outright murder. Oh, I cogitated on that as Paul finally broke through the grass, camel complaining like everything. Beyond all of that, Paul was still my Paul. It's all right, Jabeth. 
Cleaver broke through next. Finally came the little fella. They stood there chuffing and staring at my wagon and mules and turkeys like he'd just come to the circus for the first time. My mules must have thought something similar because they started braying their heads off. So then we had what we might call a standoff. There was all the assorted livestock provoked with each other, and then there was Emmett barking himself hoarse. There was Paul and Cleaver pointing guns at us, and us pointing guns at them. At least one gun. Paul spoke first. He had to raise his voice above the den to do so. Glad to see you still got your flock, Simon. He clutched at his mount a little queasily as it swayed beneath him. Made good time, too. Considerate of you to worry over it all, Paul, I shouted back. He's just that kind of a fella, piped up Cleaver from behind. All the way from Russellville to Independence, where the circus boat was waiting, your Paul just couldn't stop worrying over you and your birds, Simon, wondering how far you were getting, wondering if you were hanging on to those birds better than we did during our short period of acquaintance with them, in between peeling off patches of tar and turkey feathers, of course, the tarring and feathering was complimentary, thoughtfully performed by those Russellville folks you dumped us with. They was an interesting group of people, I opined. Paul spit, then managed to nudge at his camel's middle. Down, Allie. He gave that order with more assurance in his voice than in his face, which seemed a mite on the green side. It was fascinating watching what all a camel has to go through to get rid of its driver. All that groaning and tucking in of legs whilst first its front, then finally its rear hits the dirt. Not anywhere near as useful as a mule or horse that could easily be unmounted. With a final whomp, Allie completed the process. Paul crawled off with evident relief. Rifle foremost. I was curious, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to ask a question. How is it that you and Cleaver didn't make off with that other match pair of Arabian horses at the circus, Paul? Instead of with these accursed dregs of the animal world? Paul swung his free hand a little too close to Allie's mouth, and the camel went for it with a solid crunch of teeth. Ow! Paul kicked at the camel and pulled his hand free. He nursed it under his armpit. You see what I mean? You think we didn't go for those horses first? Unfortunately, drawled Cleaver from his perch, unfortunately, our old comrades had put a watch on the more valuable animals, as we really couldn't be expected to ride the lion or tiger, and as we had no interest in the trained dogs, our only choice of transport was narrowed down. Cleaver made sure that Paul was in control of his weapon again before kicking his own camel into a seated position. He removed himself with more aplomb than Paul had. I've actually grown somewhat fond of Fatima here during our short, closer acquaintance, haven't I, Fatima? At that point, the little camel butted Cleaver out of the way to gain access to his mama. If it wasn't for this youngster that set up such a whale, we had to bring him along. Cleaver brushed himself down, then reached for his rifle again. I'm afraid I find all children to be distasteful nuisances. Anyhow, Paul got himself back into the conversation at last. He steadied wobbly legs and burped, and his complexion turned healthier. Anyhow, Cleaver and me put a lot of thought into what we'd done wrong with them birds the last time. We figure we're now in a position to improve our methods and get them safely to Denver. Seeing as how that's the case, we thought you all might consider a trade. A trade? I asked. Folks sure had a high interest in trading these days. Yep, these here priceless camels straight from the mysterious east for your entire traveling establishment. Mr. Peace let out a hoot behind me. I guess that was sort of a hint, but I didn't need to think about Paul's suggestion for any length of time anyhow. Sorry, Paul. Camels is fine creatures, I'm sure especially on the far distant deserts of Egypt where they belongs, but I don't think the folks in Denver would want to pay me $5,000 for them, priceless or not. Enough of this silly talk, Simon, Jabeth finally broke in. 
Tell your Pa and Cleaver that if they don't set down their weapons right fast, there's going to be a few missing limbs. Cleaver chuckled. You have one gun. We have two. What happens after you use your shot? And meanwhile, while they was talking, other things was beginning to happen. But it took a little while to figure it out. Then... Something else swept out of the grass surrounding us. A bunch of somethings, bare-chested and done up with war paint, swinging rifles and hatchets and whooping up a storm. My mouth dropped open as I realized these was Indians. True blood and thunder Indians. I didn't know where to look anymore. At Paul and Cleaver? At my fine turkeys under attack from all sides? I crawled up from my spot in the dirt and blinked because suddenly the whole situation was over. Paul and Cleaver was being bound hand and foot by men who suddenly looked a lot like our Potawatomi under all that amazing war paint. I walked closer. Mr. Winter Prairie? I asked, searching through the stripes of red and yellow on his high boned cheeks. Is that you underneath all that? He grinned. It would seem to be. But I thought you Potawatomi was peace-loving hunters and farmers. We are. He checked to make sure his friends were doing a solid job with those ropes. But occasionally we get bored. We also get curious when strangers on camels cross our reservation without a buy your leave. We begin to put two and two together. As the official peacekeepers for our territory, we feel it incumbent upon ourselves to see that nothing unorthodox occurs on our lands. But, I tried, but sure and certain, we're way past your lands by this time. That would be a matter of interpretation of boundaries, would it not? And all white men know that Indians are too uneducated to truly perceive such concepts as boundaries. But my head was truly reeling by this time. But nothing, Simon. Mr. Peace was by my side at last. He stretched out his hand to Mr. Winter Prairie. May I have the honor of shaking your hand, sir? Never saw such perfect timing in my life. They shook. Mr. Peace gave me a nudge, and I shook too. Finally, Jabeth completed the process. All this time, the camels was staring at us like we was out of our minds. The turkeys, too. Then a thought came to me. Mr. Winter Prairie? He listened. Sir, I'd like to thank you for your help. You and all your friends. I pointed at some of his younger comrades who was currently having a good roaring laugh over Paul and Cleaver trussed up in the middle of the road. I'd like to make you a present, too. You surely deserve it. Ain't like a payment or something. I'd remembered almost insulting Jabez some time back. Just a free will gift from me to you and your entire tribe. Something of your liking. John Winter Prairie's eyes immediately shot to Mr. Peace's prize Arabians. Then they noted the look on the older man's face. The Indian turned his attention to my other livestock. I thank you for your kind offer, and I must admit I have been thinking about turkeys, young man, since we last met. Historically, some of my people consider them stupid and cowardly. My mouth opened in protest, but Mr. Winter Prairie just pressed on and they refused to eat them for fear of acquiring those characteristics. He paused to study my flock. A short-sighted attitude, I'm afraid. A shrug. But your birds exhibit something grander, and it's time for us to move into the modern age, as far as poultry husbandry is concerned. We still have a few wild turkeys locally, but if that stock were to be mixed with a little fresh blood... I gulped. Yes, sir. That'd be a fine idea. How many would you like? How many hens would a tom mate with in the spring? 
Knowing a fair amount about such things, I blurted it out before considering. Ten to twelve hens to the tom, sir. The hens will lay you thirty to forty eggs each by late March. A few seasons of that, and you've got yourself a flock of your own. He nodded gravely, then pulled out the handkerchief, I recalled, and began to scrub at his face paint. He finished the scrubbing. How about a dozen hens, then, and two toms, just to be safe? Throw in the camels if you don't know what to do with them. We might try breeding them as well. I breathed a sigh of relief. It could have been worse, much worse, and I'd already begun wondering what to do with the camel critters, seeing as how my mules appeared to take offense over them. You've got a deal, sir. I paused. If you'll promise to keep my paw and cleaver, too. Mr. Winter Prairie's attention shot to the captives. That giant's your father? I nodded sadly. I guess we never quite took his family. Don't hurt him, please. But I'd sooner get to Denver on my own. He studied Paul again. I can understand that. Excessive punishment shouldn't be necessary. Winter Prairie's glance passed my Paul to focus on the flock. My choice? Yes, sir. They's all fine, solid birds. Well, I guess it hurt a little to see another 14 of my flock disappearing, but it was for a good cause. It was nice thinking my turkeys might be the start of something useful for these peaceful tight Potawatomi. In a few years, they could be walking birds to Denver themselves. It didn't pain that much to say goodbye to my paw again, though. He shot me a look and then began to commence and to make noises worse than the camels when they all slunk off through the tall grass. Cleaver didn't say boo. After they'd all disappeared, Mr. Peace went around inspecting things. Looks to be a little late in the day to set off again, Simon. Any problems with just bedding down on the spot? I shook my head no. Mr. Peace bent to pick up one discarded rifle, then another. We seem to be collecting us an entire armory, boys. Sure hope it don't pour ten things to come. End of chapter 11